A very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zones, and welcome to the first issue of the FAO in Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series, jointly organized with the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO, in collaboration with the FAO Brussels Liaison Office. My name is Dominique Burgeon, and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office with the UN in Geneva, and I will be moderating today's session. Before starting our event, allow me to share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session, even if I'm sure that by now you are all experts in that. Uh, this webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our website, along with the various related resources relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about one hour and 15 minutes. Since this is an introduction to our nutrition dialogue series, the high level launch, uh, we will, there will be no Q&A session today. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for potential short intervention for, from permanent missions and partners whom we kindly ask to let us know in advance using the Q&A module, not the regular chat box. Kindly state your name and organization or institution, and we will try to accommodate some requests. Allow, all, all participants are encouraged to make suggestions also using the Q&A module on, on how they would like this dialogue series to evolve, issues they might want to be discussed or more general comments uh, you might have. If you have any problem or technical issues, please send uh, a message in the, in the chat box to ask for support. That's all for housekeeping. And I would like now to, make, to take a, a moment to briefly introduce our distinguished speaker today. We are honored and pleased to have with us today a number of distinguished speakers whom will convey the perspective of their respective organization on the issue of nutrition and more specifically on how it relates to the transformation of agri-food systems. We will hear remarks from Mr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist of FAO, Ms. Lynette Neufeld, Director of the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO, Ms. Gerda Verburg, Sun Movement Coordinator and UN Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Chen Yanjie, Counselor at the Permanent Mission of China to the UN in Geneva, Dr. Jane Wambugo, Assistant Director of Agriculture in the Minister of Agriculture of Kenya, Mr. Willem Altoff, Deputy Head of the Sustainable Agri-Food System and Fisheries Unit of the European Commission, Dr. Francesco Branca, Director of the Nutrition and Food Safety Department of WHO, Dr. Lawrence Adat, Executive Director of GAIN, Mr. Kuhn de Koning, Economist and Policy Analyst in the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of OECD, and finally, we'll have some closing remarks from my colleague, Mr. Rashad El Khafaji, Director of the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels. Thank you all very much for agreeing to be with us today. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Dr. Rui Lopez from Mexico, National Center for Disease Control, has had a last minute emergency change in his uh, agenda and won't be able to be with us today. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, before moving on to our distinguished speakers, I would like to spend a few minutes setting out why we have focused this dialogue series on agri-food system transformation to support healthy diets while also supporting development outcomes across the SDGs. It is now well established, as you know, that unhealthy diets are a major burden on human health and development. Without focusing on food as a critical contributor to better nutrition, will not achieve the sustainable development goals. With the latest edition of the SOFI, the State of Food and Nutrition Security in the World, showing that an estimated 22% of children under five are affected by stunting and 6.7% 6 by wasting, nearly 30% of women affected by anemia and adult obesity increasing in all regions there is definitely and clearly a lot of work to do. What excites us at FAO on this series are the numerous possibilities of addressing this problem through agri-food system transformations. 
this is at the heart of FAO strategic framework 2231, which calls for better nutrition, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. And I'm sure key partners in this endeavor, such as WHO, Sun, Gain, and others, are equally interested in that. We know these possibilities exist because they are being developed, tested, and implemented every day out there in the field, in field programs and national and subnational policies. It is the purpose of this open-ended dialogue series to share examples of these practices and policies from around the world. We believe they will provide a rich source of learning to inspire us all to make the most of the opportunities to transform agri-food system for better diets and nutrition. The series actually aims to increase awareness of these concrete examples, to inform policy dialogue and, field and feed policy making while strengthening cross-sectoral dialogue and collaboration between members, partners, Geneva and Brussels-based organizations and entities and beyond. Importantly too, the dialogues will show that making change in agri-food system has the potential not only to improve nutrition, but that designing the intervention and policy instrument in an intentional way also support other development outcomes, such as resilience to shocks, environmental sustainability, and economic development. With that, I, I now hand over to Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist, who will speak about better nutrition as a core element of FAO's work. Dear Maximo, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Dominique, and, and thank you all for, for being here, Excellencies and colleagues. Uh, it's great to see you all again back together in, in this such an important uh, topic uh, for us. So uh, as we know, the progress to, to meet agreed nutrition goals is insufficient. Today, the world is in a very different place to where it was seven years ago when it committed to the goal of ending hunger, food insecurity, and all forms of malnutrition by 2030. Yet progress towards ensuring access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food for all people all year around or to eradicate in all forms of malnutrition has been slow. In fact, today, there is no single country which is on track to meet all global nutrition targets. And the situation is getting even worse because of what we are facing with the war in Ukraine. Close of one in five children less than five years of age are stunted and estimated 45 million suffer from wasting, both highly concentrated in low and lower middle income countries. At the same time, overweight and obesity are on all the rise in all the regions in the world and the challenge that we are facing today because of the increasing prices will, of course, deteriorate the quality of the diets of people. Nearly 2.37 billion people did not have access to adequate food in 2020, an increase of 320 million people in just one year. The high cost of healthy diets and persistently high levels of poverty and income inequality, which was growing and has grown substantially, during COVID-19, I, I normally show a graph of Sub-Saharan Africa and how inequality has increased in, across all countries with very few exceptions is alarming. And this continues to keep healthy diets out of reach for around 3 billion people in 2020. But we expect this number to increase even more in 2021 in the new SOFI publication. New projections confirm that hunger will not be eradicated by 2030 unless something changed substantially what we called bold actions. Uh, and this needs to be taken to accelerate the progress, at least to put things on the path and on track, and especially actions to address inequality and access in, on, in access to food. Conflict, climate variability, and extremes, and economic slowdowns and downturns are the major drivers sl slowing down the progress, particularly where inequality is high. And as I mentioned before, the COVID-19 pandemic made the pathways towards achieving sustainable development goals even steeper. Eradicating poverty and hunger, the first and the second SDG, and, and for us SDG 10 also inequalities, are key to an essential for meeting all other goals. And ensuring healthy diets for all is part of our commitment uh, of SDG 1, 2, and 10, and everyone deserves more than just sufficient food for energy needs. Everyone everywhere deserves a healthy diet that enables them to live healthy and productive life. 
As development economies, I cannot overemphasize the interlinkages between these goals. Zero hunger and healthy diets for all integrates and links food security, nutrition, and sustainable climate resilient agriculture. To make progress on sustainable development, it is therefore essential to make progress on nutrition. Similarly, achieving this goal will depend on progress across many of the other SDGs, including those aimed at clean water and sanitation, renewable energy, education, and gender equality. The SDGs are indivisible. Now, our agri-food system transformation needs and is required at this point in time, and is a necessary condition for changing current trends and accelerating progress towards the meeting the SDGs and global nutrition goals. Transforming agri-food systems is essential to achieve food security, improve nutrition, and put healthy diets with each for each within each for all. When transformed with greater resilience to major drivers, including those mentioned already, food systems can provide affordable healthy diets that are sustainable and inclusive and become powerful driving force towards ending hunger, food insecurity, and nutrition in all its forms. We have been working intensively in, in, in the report that we did with other agencies on the repurposing of subsidies and the huge opportunity that we have there to align the incentives towards supporting commodities that will allow us to have the different groups of foods that we need to achieve healthy diets. Nutrition is one of the greatest development opportunities in the world today, but better data and evidence to inform actions, more coherent policies in many sectors, including food and agriculture, health among others, and increased investments are needed. This nutrition in Geneva series represents an important opportunity for dialogue to identify and address barriers that are constraining the progress, foster greater collaboration among those working with a common focus on nutrition. Central to that focus is the need to inform coherent action on agri-food system transformation. In recognition of this challenge, nutrition is now core of FAO work. As you know, the new strategic framework of FAO has four better, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. And the sequencing has a logic. We need to produce and to produce the diverse sets of foods to be able to have better nutrition. But we also need to be sustainable and to be care of our environment so that we are in a sustainable world. These four betters are the aspiration and the organizing principles of FAO work for the coming decade. Organizing FAO's work in the manner that represents a bold step towards breaking down the silos that have kept the food, agriculture, and nutrition communities working in parallel rather than in synchrony a factor that has constrained progress in nutrition for too long. This change places nutrition as a central to the achievement of FAO mandate with implications to our normative, data-related and country implementation work. Colleagues, today we observe a food crisis or a potential food crisis because of what is happening in the war in Ukraine. Prices were already up even before the war in Ukraine. But if you look historically, the problem in the 70s was related to starchy foods, to staples, to cereals. If we look to 2007, 2008, again, the problem was related to cereals. If we look at 2011, the problem again was related to cereals. And if we look today, we are again showing that our cereal export world structure is still very concentrated and any shock will create a problem. But an interesting question to ask is, is just cereals the problem? We're not looking at more healthy diets. We're not looking at more diverse food and more this availability of other food groups, not just cereals. So that opens, I think, a great uh, opportunity on this terrible situation that we are living to start with rethinking what we need to be focusing when we are talking of a more resilient world. If we want a more resilient world, we want to have better access to healthy diets, at least to the least cost ones. And for that, we need to change completely the way of thinking and not only be so concerned that there is a choke in the reduction of cereal production, but also looking at other commodities and trying to see how we can have access across the world to different diversities of food. For sure, cereals are important, but there are other different food groups that are required to be able to achieve healthy diets. The potential power of collaboration cannot be overemphasized. We welcome this dialogue series as an opportunity to share our aspirations, evidence, and experience, hear from members and other organizations on the challenges they face and the progress they have made towards our com comment goal of transforming agri-food systems. We are pleased to see so many here and look forward to a fruitful dialogues 
And it's a real pleasure to me to see all these friends and colleagues here and all of you so that we can start really moving into action and looking at the big picture because we cannot be deviated by the short shocks or the terrible shocks that we are facing. We need not to change our vision on the need agri-food system transformation, but at the same time, of course, trying to increase the resilience for us so that we can face similar shocks in the future, which I hope won't have, but we know that they could happen in the future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dominic. Thank you very much, Maximo, for, for your intervention and for reminding us that better nutrition indeed offers uh, one of the greatest development opportunities in the world today, as well as highlighting, of course, the importance of interlinkages, interaction and trade-offs in our effort to achieve the SDGs, and of course, positioning that in the, in the current context and the current situation that we are facing today. Thank you again, Maximo. And uh, I now wish to, to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Lynette uh, Neufeld, the Director of FAO's Food and Nutrition Division, who will say a few words on the FAO's nutrition strategy. Uh, dear Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. As you've heard already, nutrition is now central to the achievement of FAO's mandate and now explicitly articulated as one of our core results areas, along with better production, better environment, and a better life. We will hold ourselves accountable to the pledges made at Nutrition for Growth, the N4G Summit, and the Food Systems Summit, and as part of the UN Decade of Action for Nutrition. To provide guidance for that work and the achievement of those commitments, FAO's members approved in 2021 our, nutrition, our vision and strategy for FAO's work in nutrition covering the years 2021 to 2025. To achieve better nutrition, this better nutrition pillar, we must leverage all entry points across agri-food systems to enable people to access and consume healthy diets. The strategy articulates our core areas of work in nutrition, better generation, consolidation, accessibility, and use of data and evidence to identify and inform actions, convening and dialogue to enhance policy coherence and collective action across key areas that are currently constraining progress and accompanied by action to strengthen capacity and governance, increase concrete and achievable commitments. Through this work, we will bring a nutrition lens to increase the potential of all areas of FAO's work to contribute to healthy diets. In agriculture, working with those who are concerned about soils, in fisheries, in trade, in the climate, and in all of the other areas that uh, um, entail FAO's areas of work. To do this, we collaborate closely with UN agencies in addition to our internal colleagues within the, the uh, FAO and across all regions, but we work closely with UN agencies and many stakeholders at global, regional, national, and grassroots levels that share our common agenda for accelerating progress to achieving healthy diets for all, with a particular focus of those who live in situations of vulnerability. Without healthy diets, we will not achieve many of the SG, SDG targets or global nutrition targets, as has been mentioned. As Maximo also mentioned, we more than ever need this evidence-informed actions across agri-food systems because of the urgent needs that are now uh, coming to light in um, result of the COVID situation and the situations of conflict in the Ukraine. Agri-food systems encompass everything from ecosystems inputs to production, processing, transport, storage, food environments, and ultimately consumption and the disposable of food. A plethora of factors influence these systems, including environmental, climate, technology, infrastructure, political and economic, sociocultural and demographic. Currently, many of these factors do not favor healthy diets, and on the contrary, many work in, in the opposite direction, evidenced by the continued increase in the prevalence of overweight and obesity across all regions and the stalled progress to address many forms, most forms of undernutrition. As was mentioned already, 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet from modeled estimates, but in many contexts and in many cell groups, uh, particularly those vulnerable to malnutrition, we don't know what people are eating. We do not have that data. And we do not have the data around the unique contextual factors that drive dietary choice in populations. This is woefully scarce across almost all countries in the world and something that FAO is committed to addressing as part of our nutrition strategy. 
We are also committed, as we mentioned, to identify those entry points that allow um, specific actions to reach populations, strengthening the linkages, for example, between production at local in, uh, context and school feeding programs, where we know both the need uh, for better diets exist and the opportunities exist for linking agriculture, food systems, production, distribution to uh, where those foods are consumed. FAO's work covers most of the drivers that limit nutrition across all of those different contexts. And bringing a nutrition lens to all of these areas of work is urgently needed and a solid commitment at FAO. The many national dialogues and other activities surrounding the UN Food Systems Summit last year brought many of these issues and opportunities to the forefront in a manner unprecedented to date. We have the opportunity now to continue and accelerate that momentum. FAO's food and nutrition team have come together with the Geneva Brussels offer, uh, offices to convene this Nutrition in Geneva dialogue series. Member states and many organizations in both cities are increasingly focusing their action and taking action in agri-food systems for healthy diets and nutrition. We are looking forward to hearing about your experiences, the challenges that countries and organizations have faced and how you have addressed those challenges, and to identify new opportunities for collaboration and coherent actions. We invite you to engage actively in this dialogue series to continue that momentum towards everyone, everywhere, accessing a healthy diet that enables them to live a healthy and productive life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynette, uh, for your comments. And again, thank you also for the, the close partnership with your division and, of course, the Brussels office in this uh, series. Uh, thank you also for emphasizing the critical role that more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable agri-food system will play in enabling healthy diet for all and achieving better nutrition. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Gerda Verburg, the Sun Movement Coordinator, UN Assistant Secretary General, uh, will cover the topic of partnership and multi-sector action. Dear Gerda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dominique, and thank you very much for the leadership of FAO to organize this very important uh, seminar today. Um, why nutrition? Um, it is important, it's one of the, of the priority areas for FAO right now, but many people uh, ask me, and yesterday I was um, still visiting Mali, and I closed uh, my visit with a meeting with the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister asked me, why should we invest in nutrition? And I explained to him that an investment in nutrition is an investment in healthy people, but also in smart people, because the right nutrition, uh, nutrition is, um, is, is treating the body well and is uh, developing and maintaining and supporting the cognitive development. Without good nutrition, you get malnourished people, stunted uh, children, and stunted and malnourished uh, people will create a malnourished economy for uh, decades. Um, and very often in countries, it, the cost of hunger and malnutrition is between 5 and 15% loss of GDP. Now turn it around and think about the financial business case or the economic business case, and you can see that investing in good nutrition and preventing all forms of malnutrition will speed up the uh, GDP, the growth, the socioeconomic development of a country with uh, uh, 10 till 15 uh, percent. And it creates prosperity and uh, peace and stability. So that is why um, uh, nutrition. Why is partnerships uh, important? Are partnerships uh, important? Because nutrition is not a single issue. Um, you, it requires collaboration from the minister, Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Social Protection, Water and Sanitation, Family Affairs, uh, Education, and what have you more. Also the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Planning, you need to bring all the pieces of, the, of this important uh, puzzle together. This is one of the reasons why SUN was created, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, because 12 years ago there was a report uh, from Lancet, um, from the Lancet report that said 
de uh, global society uh, nor the local society will ever be able to end hunger and malnutrition because you all have a siloed approach. Only by working together as uh, different sectors and different stakeholders, um, you will be able to do something about it. At the same time, um, uh, one of the conclusions was, was ending hunger and malnutrition is a matter of political will. So it requires also ownership and investment from a government. So it's not only sectors that needs to come together, need to come together, it is also the private sector. It is the civil society, it is UN organizations that need to work uh, together and hand in hand, and they are doing it more and more. Um, but it's also uh, the donors and investors who need to align behind country uh, priorities. So um, country ownership, multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach, that is what nutrition requires. And guess what? This is also what investment in uh, nutritious food systems and nutritious agri-food systems require. Multi-sectoral approach and multi-stakeholder collaboration to implement and scale up. So um, it is an investment in people and people's nutrition. It must be an investment in the planet, the, uh, the nourishing of, the, uh, of our planet and maintaining the environment or uh, adapting to climate change. But it's also an investment in prosperity and in jobs along the food value chain. So what to do these days, and especially in this dire situation? First of all, make sure that humanitarian support um, is combined with social protection. Otherwise, um, with only providing foodstuffs, uh, you might create damage for years. Um, the, the second point what to do is, is to bring the different sectors together to look at how dependent a country is from imports. And um, many countries in Africa are dependent of food uh, imports for 30%, 40%, and some countries even for more. This has to end. A country like Mali is investing 15% of its a national budget in importing food. What if you could transition this 15% into investment in a, a nutritious and sustainable food system in Mali uh, itself? And the different stakeholders, the private sector, the farmers, the consumers organizations and civil society told me, we stand ready to sit with the government, but then we need to be able to discuss what are the requirements? What is the framework? And why, uh, how can we uh, transform the oversubsidizing of imported foods so that we, as food producers in Mali, uh, in the country itself, are able to produce in a competitive way and the consumers don't need to pay at a price that is too high. So this is all uh, needed right now. And at the same time, because the transition of food systems need uh, to be started already or to be speeded up. And I think the follow-up of the food systems summit last uh, September is, uh, needs to be uh, speeded up at the country level in the food systems pathway and the transition. Finally, um, in all you do and all your government does or um, your country does, make sure that you pay extra attention to women and girls because women and girls have uh, a special need for nutrition, special nutritious need. And in every uh, crisis, women and girls are hit hardest, longest and um, most. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gerda, for providing us with this, uh, for with your perspective, for reminding us of the importance of the return investment, of investing in, in good nutrition, for the importance of partnership, which really takes a whole of society effort with the, the support of the international community. Community reminding us among 
many things of the importance of also of, uh, of social protection and of course always to keep in mind the, the gender uh, dimension. So thank you very much uh, for that. And it is now my, my pleasure uh, to give the floor to uh, Mr. Yang Ye uh, Shen, Councillor at the Permanent Mission of China to the UN in Geneva, who will give us the perspective of his country uh, on the topic. Uh, Mr. Shen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director uh, Dominic uh, Bridger. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm uh, greatly honored to have the floor today. Food security is an important guarantee for world peace and development, and an important foundation for building a community with a shared future for mankind and promoting the sustainable development of mankind. China attaches great importance to food security. President Xi Jinping solemnly proposed the Global Development Initiative at the general debate of the 76th United Nations General Assembly taking food security as one of the eight key areas of cooperation. We hope all the people can be kept away from the threat of hunger and more countries and regions can improve sustainable agricultural production capacity and achieve common prosperity. It shows the sincerity of China to join hands with other countries to tackle the problem of global hunger and is a positive action for maintaining world food security. China makes great efforts to enhance agricultural production and has always regarded food supply to the people as a top priority in state governments with 9% of the world's arable land, China has fed more than 1.4 billion people and realized that the transition from inadequate food to enough and a historic shift to eat well. Over the years, China has carried out agricultural cooperation with countries and the regions in need and promoted technologies and experiences in green production, processing, warehousing, logistics, and trade, especially in the process of jointly building the Belt and the Road. China and the countries along the Belt and the Road have actively carried out cooperation in the field of food. Chinese researchers have trained more than 14,000 professionals from relevant countries on hybrid rice through international training courses. China's food security is inseparable from the world, and the world's food security also needs China. We have created the miracle of self-sufficiency on food and are willing to actively participate in the governance of world food security. China will continue to work in solidarity with the food and agriculture organization and other countries to make new contributions to promoting the healthy development of the world's food industry and maintaining world food security. Finally, we greatly appreciate the marvelous contributions made by the food and agricultural organization in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shen, for highlighting your country efforts, both domestically and on the international scene. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like now to move to our next speakers. Uh, we will give uh, first uh, a country perspective and then a uh, perspective from uh, a regional organization, the European uh, Commission, 
on uh, their thought in that regard. So first, I would like to uh, to move uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Jane Wambugu, uh, Assistant Director of Agriculture in the Ministry of Agriculture of uh, Kenya. Uh, Dr. Wambugu, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you every, uh, for this invitation. My name is Jane Wambogo. I'm a deputy director in agriculture and I head agriculture and nutrition unit in the Kenya government ministry of agriculture department. I will share with you the role I've played to champion the agenda of transforming agri-food system to deliver on the healthy diets in Kenya. This agenda requires involvement of all relevant sectors and to demystify the notion that addressing malnutrition is the sole role of the health sector. There are a number of key efforts in Kenya that have been done geared towards improving intersectoral coordination, enhancing political will, capacity development, and as well as uh, strengthening the capacities of nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system, as well as responding to the emerging nutrition needs due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As I play a leading role in the agri nutrition unit, I've been working closely with other line ministries, as well as partners, the, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, w Food, uh, World Food Program, as well as the UNICEF and other partners. And based on this partnership and collaboration, we have achieved a lot. Among the key achievements I would love, uh, I wish to mention here is uh, one of them is the strengthening the coordination. We do realize multi-sectoral collaboration uh, to sustainably address malnutrition requires proper coordination. And for this reason, as the chair of the Food and Nutrition Technical Working Group, I've been playing a leading role in coordinating all relevant stakeholders for nutrition sensitive agriculture. This platform brings together the government ministries, including agriculture, the health, education, water, labor, and social protection, plus other development partners, the UN agencies, the NGOs, academia, as well as research, research organizations are part of this platform. The purpose of this technical working group is to steer and coordinate development of agri nutrition strategies, plans, interventions, both at the subnational level and as, as well as national level. The other key achievement I'll bring out is the improved political will for agri nutrition. In collaboration with this uh, Food and Nutrition Linkage Technical Working Group, which I share, I've led the process of developing the first ever national agri nutrition implementation strategy 2020 to 2025. This offers practical guidance on strategic intervention for decision makers at national and subnational level for implementing agri nutrition programs. The strategy is endorsed by the Minister for Agriculture and as well as the Principal Secretary for the State Department for Crop Development and Agricultural Research. The strategy accelerates key resource area number 10 of the Kenyan Nutrition Action Plan, the guiding document for nutrition in the country. And it commits to scale up nutrition in agriculture and food system as a sustainable measure for alleviating malnutrition. The other area that we have worked on is capacity strengthening. While the agri-nutrition implementation offers a guidance to as, uh, as an entry point for nutrition improvement through agriculture, I realize stakeholders require a needed capacity strengthening using well contextualized technical materials. Through the FAO technical support and collaborative efforts with the partners, we are in an advanced stage of finalizing a standardized training package for nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system for the country Kenya. The package has been unleashed with over 30 case studies from 25 partners 
who are implementing nutrition sensitive agriculture projects in the country. It has been used to train directors and technical staff in the agriculture and health from 26 out of the 47 subnational governments. These efforts have yielded immediate results, and many subnational governments have requested for support or are in the process of domesticating the national strategy to meet the subnational needs. There are a number of other successes, but I wish to mention one of them, having been the One Million Kitchen Garden Initiative, which was uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It, aimed to, uh, it aims to address the sustainability of food production by empowering farmers in urban and peri-urban areas to produce nutritious food. Through my leadership and practical examples, we have used practical and media, media to demonstrate on establishment of water and space efficient kitchen garden technologies, that this is ongoing and uh, the, the, we have also strengthened the capacities of household. So far, we have reached 233,000 households who have established kitchen garden. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful to the partners who have been very instrumental in driving these achievements. As a country, we are still a long way to go to scale up ongoing efforts. And now I call up a more upon our global partners to support in resources and in investment in this noble initiative that we are undertaking. Thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to present what our country, Kenya, and what we are doing to add agri-food system for transforming and, and for transforming them to healthy diet for the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wambugu, for indeed highlighting how political will can lead to strengthening uh, multi-sectoral coordination and, co and coordination through the Food and Nutrition Technical Working Group. All this for uh, nutrition-sensitive agriculture leading to strategic planning and then highlighting the very concrete action through the, the one million kitchen garden uh, initiative uh, that you have highlighted. Thank you so much. And I'm now uh, very pleased to give the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Willem Oltoff, the Deputy Head of Unit of the Sustainable Agriculture, Agri-Food Systems and Fisheries Unit of the European Commission. Uh, dear Wim, uh, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Dominique, and many thanks as well for taking this initiative. Uh, I think it's timely, it's relevant, and you're uh, in, in the best position to, to do this and bring many of the actors around nutrition, food, and uh, agriculture together. Um, it's also timely because um, we know that the war in Ukraine le leads to, to dramatic situations in the world and, and an increase in global food insecurity and malnutrition. And um, this will no doubt lead to, to lots of um, uh, additional interventions and initial uh, additional initiatives. And uh, I just would like to mention uh, two initiatives that the uh, European Commission has taken recently, um, one uh, around the crisis in the Sahel and one uh, in the Horn of Africa that actually happened yesterday. And in both of these events, uh, we work hand in hand um, uh, with uh, humanitarian and development actors and um, um, have led these, both of them have led to, to increased pledges uh, to, um, uh, uh, to address food insecurity, but also the nutritional elements in it. Um, now, Although we have uh, really short-term pressing needs, we should also not lose sight of the longer-term objectives that we have. And um, in the longer term, what um, we would like to see, and I think uh, here we, we, we have a very uh, strong common agenda, is that our food systems in the world become more resilient more sustainable and that we see also the, the problems of healthy diets and nutrition within such a food systems perspective. 
Within the EU, um, we have taken on the farm to fork strategy and, and started its implementation. And this farm to fork strategy provi provides a really powerful policy framework in support of this urgent transition to healthy and sustainable food systems. Not only in Europe, we think that, that much of the vision that comes out of it is relevant beyond uh, the EU. What this strategy also clearly illustrates is that uh, the financial resources and putting finances on it is not enough. Um, one has to, um, to include um, uh, the right policies. Investments can only work uh, once one, uh, one has the, the right policies. And in that respect, uh, what has been triggered by the Food Systems Summit is, is, is really relevant. And I'll come back to that at the end of my intervention. So system thinking is important. Um, that means that, that our sector policies needs to be framed within such systems thinking, that food systems um, tackle more issues. They tackle issues around inequities, uh, around climate change, about natural resource management, um, and that all in combination with diets and better nutritional outcomes. Important is and remains agriculture and the way agriculture is being um, is, is being uh, handled and and um, and and produced um, and uh, others have said before the, before me so I won't dwell that the nutrition sensitive element of, of agriculture is a key uh, element in this that that implies that one has to think about how it enhances biodiversity, for instance, uh, but also um, the diversification of production. And in that respect, uh, from, from our perspective, agroecological practices are important, adapted to local context, respectful of the environment, and um, an important means to uh, stimulate local production uh, and, and, and varied uh, diets. We also recognize that uh, in, in many respects, more attention can be given uh, in this diversification to, for instance, different sources, plant proteins, but also proteins coming from small livestock, from, from blue food production particularly. Um, so there is, there is a, a huge diversification agenda ahead of us. Um, but we cannot only think about uh, production, uh, we also should think about the role of the consumers and consumer choice. And in that respect, one can also think of many different policy directions, uh, many of which are, again, part and parcel of the EU uh, 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 farm to fork strategy. So uh, examples around public procurement, public food procurement, uh, about how to engage the, uh, the private sector and to, to stem to unlock their financing, um, but also in restricting the advertising and marketing uh, of, of a particular type of foods and the beverages, for instance, those high in saturated and trans fats in sugars and in, in, in salt. Um, and, and to use fiscal incentives uh, around their use, uh, but also um, elements about nutrition labeling, et cetera, and um, advertising co communication and, and, and more of those uh, measures. So in a nutshell, um, what we have identified in the EU farm to fork strategy, uh, but also more broadly, is, is a set a range of instruments um, that, we, that can allow consumers to have a a bigger impact on the way food is produced um, and, uh, and marketed. Um, so I said that I, at the end of my intervention, I wanted to come back to the UN Food Systems Summit, but also at the, the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Um, in, at the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, many valuable uh, initiatives have been taken and um, we are in, in, in a year of follow-up and, uh, and, and we recognize all as well that FAO has, a, has an important role with hosting the hub um, and um, we need to see the translation of many of these um, these initiatives in the national pathways but also in the in the in the global coalitions. 
Um, so as as EU, we stand ready to to support many countries in in the implementation of their national pathways, uh, working as well in a number of global coalitions. And uh, we are particularly active in in eight coalitions, and uh, that includes uh, the Coalition on Healthy Diets. It includes a coalition on zero hunger. It includes a coalition on school meals. So we have uh, quite a number of entry points on the nutrition side. We would also like to recall that um, at the Nutrition for Growth Summit, uh, the uh, EU and its member states pledged more than 4 billion euros for the next couple of years to work on nutrition, of which 2.5 billion came from the uh, European institutions. Um, That uh, summit was only uh, four months uh, ago, and it seems uh, like like, a life has, has, uh, it's it's a lifetime ago now. But we are um, really following actively in in the follow up to this pledge. We're working very closely with our delegations. We have an excellent um, advisory service that, um, that translates many of the initiatives and the principles into very concrete projects and programs. Programs. We provide actively training to, to our delegations plus counterpart staff on, uh, on this. So um, a pledge like the one that we made uh, last year is not just uh, something on paper. It means something and it is becoming, uh, it's, it's, it's an alive um, uh, uh, initiative in, in that sense. So with those words, um, um, Dominique, uh, many thanks again for the initiative. I look forward to uh, to many more of these uh, sessions and, and exchanging information on more depth um, on uh, particular initiatives. And I, I really valued uh, the example from Kenya and um, uh, I, I trust that we are also part of this uh, this, this initiative, which looks uh, looks very uh, uh, promising. Um, but it's it's a good way to to exchange our knowledge, to exchange our experiences. And as I said at the beginning, this year we'll have no shortage of of events. But let's stay focused that it it includes our nutrition uh, objectives. Many thanks again. Thank you very much, women. Indeed, today event is just the. Uh... I have a launch of the series and we will have, will, I would say, zoom in many of, of the example to really uh, inform policy making and further sensitize uh, decision makers on that. Thank you, uh, Wim, also for reminding us of the importance of the system thinking, uh, which is indeed key, and for highlighting the, uh, the EU uh, perspective in terms of the farm to four policy to support healthy and sustainable uh, food system and highlighting some of the, the related uh, instruments. Uh, and like many speakers, of course, you refer to the uh, UN Food System Summits and, uh, and uh, the importance of the national pathways and, uh, and uh, of the global efforts. So thank you for that. And uh, it is now time to move to uh, two representatives of the uh, Geneva-based organizations who are partners in this, uh, in this series and whom we look forward to work with. Uh, namely, uh, Dr. Francesco Branca, the Director of Nutrition and Food Safety uh, Department of WHO, and Dr. Lawrence Haddad, Executive Director of GAIN. Uh, Dr. Branca, Francesco, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I would like to thank uh, FAO for organizing this dialogue, convening, convening this dialogue, and particularly Dominique and, and his team. And uh, WHO is happy to engage. Uh, and uh, In order to show you why, I'd like to show you one image. And this image is really speaking to why food system transformation is needed to improve health. There are at least five pathways for this. Uh, Unhealthy diet and food insecurity, zoonotic pathogens, you've seen it with the COVID pandemic, antimicrobial resistance, this is related to the way we uh, grow livestock, uh, unsafe and and adulterated food, environmental contamination and degradation, and occupational hazard. And I can say that only two of these pathways, which is uh, number one and number three, they account for one third of total deaths and disability. So uh, health should not be an afterthought, but structural objective. So 
thank you. We don't need uh, this slide anymore. Uh, uh, our department, uh, Nutrition and Food Safety Department uh, in WHO, is dealing with uh, multiple aspects from uh, setting really food and nutrition elements in the global health agenda, developing norms and standards for healthy diet and safe food, and really supporting the Codex Alimentarius, guide policy choices, uh, support country actions, and monitoring the implementation of policies and the impact of the policies. And I think we have really a good match with uh, the strategy of nutrition that Lynette uh, uh, has described. Talking about policies, indeed, we believe that uh, they need to be applied uh, uh, across the system and uh, the food environment is particularly important. So we're, we're, we're focusing on food environment policies. I, um, I, I think that Wim already mentioned the importance uh, of uh, the choosing the right policies. And uh, uh, those right policies are the ones that uh, we're recommending based on an analysis of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. We have a series of best buys uh, in the, uh, to, to improve the food environment and looking at uh, um, information to consumers through appropriate uh, uh, and clearly understandable labeling, uh, restricting uh, uh, marketing of foods high in uh, fat, sugar, and salt, uh, uh, making uh, public food procurement uh, the, the, the uh, system to provide healthy diets, uh, but also having food adequately uh, fortified, having uh, safe food uh, throughout, and using economic tools such as uh, fiscal policies and subsidies to, um, to nudge the choices towards healthy food. So, uh, uh, those food environment policies uh, are there, are critical, but we need to make sure that they, they are uh, implemented. And implementation requires uh, uh, partnerships. I, I, I do agree that uh, with, with Gerda that partnership is, is critical. Uh, uh, we have uh, first and foremost a partnership uh, with uh, other UN agencies, uh, FAO, but also UNICEF World Health Program, IFAR and others in the context uh, of uh, UN nutrition. We partner with several civil society organizations. GAIN is an organization in official liaison status. And we are very pleased to engage with the Committee of Food Security. That is uh, an incredible venue for uh, multi-sectoral uh, and multi-stakeholder interactions. We believe that uh, the UN Food System Summit and Nutrition for Growth uh, uh, really made a very important contribution to boost the action to improve nutrition and, and food security. Uh, we ourselves are going to promote more partnership and, and uh, together with FAO and UN Nutrition, we are uh, hosting and, and promoting the Healthy uh, Diet Coalition. Uh, WHO is, is keen uh, to uh, sustain the implementation of the UN Food System Summit. Uh, we're contributing to the uh, hub uh, with our with our time, with our staff, with our engagement, uh, and we believe this is uh, the only way to um, complete uh, our uh, path towards the sustainable development goals. We're still in the middle of the decade of action on nutrition, as was mentioned at the beginning, and we are uh, actively pursuing this. So we are very pleased that uh, by having this uh, uh, joint dialogues, we can highlight. Uh, the priorities for action, and we can even more first foster uh, engagement and investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for your for your comments, for your support to the approach, and for of course reminding of the importance of the focus on uh, food environment policies, their implementation, and the required partnerships. Uh, referring uh, in particular also to the role of UN nutrition and even the, the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security. So thank you for that. And let me uh, now move uh, to uh, Dr. Lawrence Haddad, the Executive Director of GAIN. Uh, Dr. Haddad, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dominique. And um, again, let me extend my thanks to FAO for organizing this session, for inviting us at GAIN, 
and a big thanks to Dominique and his team for organizing this. Um, so GAIN is the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. We're an international NGO. We have offices in 15 different countries. And we, we do two things. We connect uh, food systems with, nutri with nutrition. There are lots of people who worry about food systems, but don't worry about nutrition. And actually, there are a lot of people who worry about nutrition, but don't worry about food systems. So we try to connect those two communities. We also try to connect the public sector with the private sector. Uh, governments have to be in the lead in terms of setting goals and strategies and norms and standards and enforcing those. But the private sector is a big part of the food system, whether it's farmers themselves, processors, um, traders, um, uh, supermarkets, wet markets, um, haulage, advertising, storage, refrigeration, you name it. Uh, the private sector is fully embedded in the food system and, and it's an important partner. So we try and do that. We try and we do that through, we do those connections through programs, through policy and through research. The programs uh, help us achieve direct impact to people who are malnourished uh, and they give us an insight into the policy uh, space that's holding back programs like ours and programs uh, that others uh, run. We Our policy work therefore is, is um, focusing on um, relieving and uh, relieving bottlenecks, making it easier for programs to to scale and have a bigger impact. And um, we our research work means that we are really evidence based. We are doing the right things in the right place in the right way and achieving the right impacts. And our director of research, uh, Lennart Ufeld, is now a FAO's new director of food and nutrition, and we're, we're very happy for FAO and for Lynette. Um, we do this, uh, that all of this work is, the, the purpose of all of this work, again, is to improve the consumption of safe, nutritious food for the most vulnerable, for all, but for the most vulnerable, um, produced and supplied in a sustainable way. Uh, and we do this by focusing on the demand side, the supply side, and the enabling environment side. The demand side is really important. We, uh, many of us take, uh, uh, take for granted that people want to consume healthier healthier diets well many people don't um, it's not a question of income for many it isn't a question of income and affordability but for many it's not they they just don't know about the what is a healthy diet and what are the benefits of a healthy diet are um, on the supply side um, we have to we have to obviously make the supply of nutritious and safe food and the foods that comprise healthy diets are more affordable as Lynette said three billion people can't afford a healthy diet. We have to do something about that, and then we have to do we have to work on the enabling environment side that makes the demand and the supply uh, bend towards nutritious, safe food, for which healthy diets can be derived uh, in a sustainable way. So, to give you some three quick examples of of some of the work on the on the uh, supply side, we work a lot with uh, smaller medium enterprises in the food system. Smaller medium enterprises that are producing nutritious foods: fruits, vegetables, pulses, dairy, eggs, um, some some animal source foods, fish. Um, those smaller medium enterprises, they and we do this with Fow and many others. They, uh, they produce for domestic consumption, not for export, and they are severely constrained. Uh, they don't have great business models, they don't have great investable propositions, um, they don't have great marketing strategies, and they have poor access to finance. So we, and, they're, and they're not very well connected either. And we work with Sun and we co-host with the World Food Programme, the Sun Business Network, to connect those SMEs together. So that's that's one example on, on the supply side. On the demand side, we are doing a lot of work with Harvest Plus and, and others on nutrient-dense food staples, which are going to become more important, I think, as the Ukraine crisis unfolds. Uh, the challenge there is to convince farmers that this is something that they should uh, produce. It's uh, just as profitable as regular staples. It's, it's uh, derived from conventional breeding techniques. Uh, and also to convince consumers that they, they should plump for these, these types of foods because they have high levels of nutrition, they can generate the kinds of benefit cost ratios that Gerda was alluding to. On the enabling environment side, we do a lot of work uh, with legislation. In, in Bangladesh, we were working with the government just recently to pass legislation, to help them pass legislation to fortify edible oil with vitamin D and vitamin A, which will reach tens of millions of people. 
Um, but we also, as Lynette said, um, data is the first casualty of any crisis. And we're working with uh, many government agencies uh, to develop uh, national and subnational food system data dashboards. Um, we have been in the follow up to the UN Food System Summit. Again, was the chair of Action Track One, which is uh, enhancing access to safe and nutritious food. And in that regard, we are working very closely with the, the governments in which we have country offices to support the development and implementation of their food system transformation pathways. Uh, as, as Willem said, very, very important. And with the Ukraine crisis in mind, uh, diversification is, is, is key. Diversification of where food is grown, diversification of the types of value chains and the lengths of value chains that are employed, uh, diversification in the types of foods grown. Can we place a greater emphasis on neglected, often underutilized crops? Diversification in what people consume. We know that's the best proxy for diet quality. And of course, diversification in the types of energy that is used to produce and supply and consume and prepare all of that. A final point, really, and, and, and by the way, I should say, um, uh, Jane, we're, we stand ready and we are working closely with the government of Kenya. To, to do that and support your national pathway. My final point, uh, Dominique, is the word alliance is in GAIN's name, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And we take that very, very seriously indeed. And we look forward to working with all of you. Many of you we are working with and the ones we're not, we look forward to working with you as we go towards 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lawrence, for indeed providing us uh, information on the, the work of, of GAIN, the importance of uh, ev being evidence-based and to work on this uh, demand side, supply side, and the enabling environment and providing us with examples. And I think this is really be, this will be really at the core of the following events in this series is to illustrate all these aspects, again, to be able to inform uh, and feed uh, policy making. So thank you very much for that. And yes, the word alliance, well noted, and this is what it's all about. Uh, and now uh, I would like to actually to move to one of our last speaker uh, and I and give the floor to Mr. Kuhn de Koning, economist and policy analyst in the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of OECD, will speak about the food system approach as the basis for collaboration. Mr. de Koning, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's really a pleasure to be here and the challenge too, to say something interesting uh, if, uh, coming as last speaker after all these other distinguished uh, people. Um, so I, I'm, I'm here to share some insights, I hope, uh, on th this very important topic of nutrition. And in the OECD, we released a major report on food systems. Our very first report on the concept of food systems actually last year. Uh, we also had a chance to engage with many of you throughout the UN Food Systems Summit. And a lot of our focus on food systems was around this idea of synergies and trade-offs. And as Lawrence mentioned just now, people often tend to think of things in isolation, but it is really important to look at it from a systemic point of view, to look at all the interactions that happen. But that raises the question, how do you come up with coherent policies? Right? How do you come up with policies that will actually reinforce each other, whether it's on environment, on livelihoods, on gender, and of course, on nutrition, rather than as has historically been the case, uh, where you had the agriculture ministry doing one thing, the environment ministry doing something else, uh, the nutrition people doing yet something else. So how do you actually do that? And we spend some time thinking and arguing about that in our report. And so the first big lesson for us is the importance of overcoming these silos and of at least realizing that there are many possible synergies and trade-offs. And it is a complex system. Uh, historically, people were not even aware of that. Fortunately, that is changing now. But we do need to put even more effort to make sure that people talk over the fence, that uh, the, the ministries of agriculture, public health, environment, etc., that all the different policymakers actually do have a chance to get to know each other, to talk about these things and to form a common view on these things. So that is a really a first precondition to have policies that reinforce each other across all these different dimensions rather than counteracting as has often happened in the past. But a second 
important caveat there is that we need to be rigorous too. And this is a point that some of the other speakers have mentioned, Lynette Neufeld in particular, when she mentioned the importance of data. Uh, because quite often what you see in debates on food systems, when people talk about synergies and trade-offs, is that we often use ideas or assumptions, and those may not always be correct. So to give you just one example, in high-income countries, people often would say that agricultural subsidies contribute to obesity because they make food artificially cheap and therefore people eat too much. And it turns out that the evidence doesn't support that. In many countries, agricultural policies are actually not subsidies, they are protectionist import barriers, and they often raise the price of food in many of these countries. And so that link between agricultural policies and obesity is not as obvious as people often think it is, in rich countries at least. So while there are very good reasons to reform agricultural policies, fighting obesity in high-income countries is maybe not the most important factor. So it is important, as this example underscores, to be rigorous, and that in turn means we need better data, we need better evidence, as, as Lawrence Haddad also underscored. And a third point which builds on that, on that one is we need to dive, when we are thinking about coherent policies, we need to go into the specifics of specific policy instruments. Sometimes you will hear people argue whether or not there are synergies or trade-offs between, for example, farmer livelihoods and the environment. But when we ask the question at such a broad level, that is not the most interesting level. Uh, let me give you an example to illustrate. Imagine if a country is using fertilizer subsidies to provide income support to farmers. In that case, it is likely that the farmer will end up using maybe more fertilizer than is needed, which in turn can create environmental problems. So in that specific example, there is a trade-off or a tension between helping the farmer and helping the environment. But it is also clear that that is just an artifact of that one specific choice of policy instrument. And we can easily imagine other policy instruments that would have a much better profile. For example, we could pay the farmer for ecosystem services. And in that case, we might actually turn a trade-off into a synergy. So the question of whether there is a trade-off or a synergy, it's not an abstract philosophical question. We really have to analyze this for specific policy instruments. Now, what do you do then when there are synergies and trade-offs? Uh, of course, everybody loves a synergy, everybody loves a win-win situation. But we do have to keep in mind that the perfect policy does not exist, and we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In reality, you will probably need a mix of different policy instruments. And there were great examples here from Dr. Wambugu and, and Mr. Oldhoff on the, the wide range of different instruments that policymakers are thinking about. And that is very important. It, it also means that if we are trying to achieve many food systems goals at once, and we have one intervention that, for example, does a great job at improving nutrition, but does not really move the needle much in terms of, for example, livelihoods or gender issues, that does not make it a bad instrument. We can think of other instruments to achieve those other goals. And so we, we have to think in terms of a mix of instruments that together achieve our food systems goals, rather than trying to find the one perfect intervention. Um, another example of that principle is many people are now thinking whether we should use agricultural subsidies to promote the production of more nutritious food. And Maximo Torero mentioned some of the recent work that has been going on on repurposing agricultural support in this regard. And there, is, there are some studies that suggest that you could indeed uh, use agricultural subsidies uh, in, to incentivize production of more nutritious foods. But the question is, is that really the best instrument? And for example, as Lawrence Haddad also mentioned, it is not always a problem of prices. There might also be demand side factors that explain why people are not actually making more nutritious food choices. And even if it is a supply side issue, it might not be something that is easily fixed with agricultural subsidies. So it's again a case for keeping an open mind and for being very rigorous in terms of data and evidence. And the last point I want to make is uh, Equally important and sometimes neglected, but we've spoken a bit about synergies now, but unfortunately there are also trade-offs. And ideally, we do our best to find the optimal policy mix to make those trade-offs as small as possible. Um, but sometimes there will simply be trade-offs and we cannot achieve everything we want to achieve. And in that case, we need to make a choice. And 
how do we think about those choices? Those are not simply things for scientists or people in international organizations, policy analysts like myself. We cannot make those decisions. We can provide the best possible evidence. But then in the end, if there is a choice, that has to be a societal choice. And that will depend on value judgments. And so I'll just uh, leave it at that, at emphasizing the importance of having democratic debate about these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. De Corning, for this uh, very thoughtful intervention indeed, and for indeed highlighting the importance of synergies and trade-offs uh, that need to be, uh, and decision-making that need to be uh, evidence-based, and the importance, again, of system approach to develop coherent and specific policies. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I wish to note that there has been a really a rich engagement in the, the Q&A module, as well as in the chat box, uh, really it gives us uh, it's a big encouragement for us to continue with this series. The, the speakers have also uh, gave us so many uh, directions we will need to, to further explore in, uh, in the future events under this series. So I think this has been uh, extremely valuable from our perspective to, to have this engagement in writing, as well as in the context, of course, of the high-level speakers. Uh, remarks. And uh, now uh, we are almost at the end of uh, our webinar, and I'm now very pleased to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. Rashad uh, Al Khafaji, uh, Director of the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels, uh, will deliver some uh, closing remarks. Uh, Rashad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. The FAO Liaison Office here in Brussels is obviously delighted to be partnering in this uh, important dialogue series to support the process of learning on this critical topic. Today, we've listened to valuable contributions, uh, which tied together many threads of our discussion and gave us a lot to think about. What an excellent opportunity to certainly work together, learn together, and also contribute together. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, the promise of agri-food system transformation requires regional, national, and local champions. What we heard today from Kenya and the European Commission shows that we have champions working on enacting change. Thank you for sharing your views and experiences with us today. The OECD's analysis made it very clear. It is not just about nutrition, but about the whole development agenda. This is something which will be featured throughout this series of dialogues. We certainly look forward to seeing you again over the next few months as we highlight specific practices and policies directly from the field, including food-based dietary guidelines, urban strategies, and food safety. Enabling healthy diets and achieving better nutrition for all is a challenge that no one single organization or institution can resolve. And there is no one size fits all solution to deal with the complexity of this task and its sustainable implementation. This is why partnerships such as the ones we have in the framework of this series launched today with WHO, Sun, GAIN, and many others are key in this endeavor. Success also relies heavily on the engagement and political will at country level, where the key outcomes are needed. We will continue supporting the rollout of the FAO and Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series. FAO is keen to offer platforms such as this one to discuss and share information on the good work done by countries and partners in the field. These lessons and experiences are fundamental to build a new narrative on nutrition, putting partnerships at country and local levels at the center of our action. Let me reiterate that this is just the beginning for the Nutrition Dialogue series. In the coming sessions, we will explore in depth the various facets of this issue and discover successful examples of important work in the field. We will share FAO's experience and provide our partners with opportunities to share theirs. Keeping the main focus on concrete cases from the field, some of the topics we are envisioning for future sessions include food-based dietary guidelines, urban strategies, food safety, healthy diets in small island developing states, and others. I strongly encourage our partners to be active participants in this endeavor. And we look forward to receiving suggestions from you on topics to be covered and important field work to be featured. Together, we need to increasingly bring nutrition into policy development and inform high-level decisions in Geneva, Brussels, and beyond. The next webinar in this series will take place on Wednesday, the 18th of May. 
It will show how intervening in food systems can address the problem of acute malnutrition among children, while also supporting livelihoods in Africa's dry lands, and will draw from important field work in Kenya. Until then, I wish you a very productive reflection, hopefully also stimulated by today's proceedings. Thank you very much, and over to you, Dominique. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rashad, for these very encouraging and uplifting words. Uh, dear participants, uh, dear concludes, this concludes our webinar today. Uh, we had more than 150 participants uh, who attended this launch event, and I think this is a great start for our FAO in Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series. Before leaving you, allow me to thank you all and our distinguished uh, speakers in particular who dedicated some of their valuable time to be with us today. Their guidance and outlook is very much appreciated and will definitely inform uh, when we move forward. I would like also to thank our Geneva partners, WHO, GAIN and SUN, for highlighting uh, for us why this is such a key issue and for the work uh, they are doing and uh, for the partnership will even further strengthen in the coming month. A big thank also uh, to Maximo, Lynette and Rashad for their participation and to colleagues in the FAO uh, Food and Nutrition Division and the Brussels and Geneva uh, Liaison Office for organizing this webinar. Last, last but not least, our gratitude goes to you participants for taking time and joining this launch event for the of the FAO in Geneva uh, Nutrition Dialogue uh, Series. Uh, I thank you all and look forward to engaging with you in the near future. Thank you. And thank you, Dominique Bye. and uh, Rashad and team for taking this uh, very important initiative. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye to all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.